those concerts with the New York Philharmonic every Sunday morning. And I listened to the violins when I was seven years old, and I loved them. I wanted to play the violin. But I never told my parents, you know, which would be pretty important. So fast forward to when I was in fourth grade, John Oberbrunner from the Syracuse Symphony came to each one of our classrooms, played the flute and the piccolo. It's beautiful. Told us we could come to the cafeteria on Thursday morning at one o'clock and sign up for lessons and rent an instrument. Instrument rental, I think, was $10 for the year and the group lessons were free. He said, don't come before one o'clock because we're not giving out instruments before one, so just don't don't come before one. So I thought, I'm not taking any chances. I'm going to come about 10 to 1. So I get down there, I walk into the cafeteria, people are walking out with instruments all, all over the place. I think, what's going on here? They said they're not going to give out instruments until 1 o'clock. So I get to the desk and I said, do you have any flutes? We were out of those half an hour ago. Hmm. How, okay. Hmm. How about a, a trumpet? A uh, clarinet? <laughs> Takes me into this back room, dusts off the case, opens it up. This, we just got one, this is one instrument left. It's a violin. <laughs> My father was ecstatic. In fourth grade, it's not cool to play the violin. <laughs> Trust me. A few years later, I told my mother I wanted to be a folk singer. So the next day, she came home with a half size Stella guitar, which I still had, and a book on how to play the guitar. So I taught myself how to play, play the guitar. Then from there, I uh, played electric guitar like a lot of kids. Formed bands when you're, of course, we in junior high school, now it's middle school. But <clears throat> my cousin bought a new set of drums and it said the Chevelles on the bass, on the bass drum. So that was the, that became the name of our band. My friend Rob joined another band and they needed a bass player. So I, he said, can you do that? I thought, well, it's the same four strings as the low strings on the guitar. I'll do it. When you're offered an opportunity, take it. They're very few and far between in the music business. When you get it, when you get an opportunity, take it. You know you can change your mind and later get another opportunity, but you don't know. I almost I almost learned how to play the trumpet for the same reason. Rob joined another band and a soul band. <coughs> and they I figured the soul band at that time, they were they were, the home sessions weren't do, doing much at all, so I thought, I could learn that. But I got a bass game before I had to find the trumpet, so that turned out okay. I think when I was 13 or 14, you know, Leonard, Leonard Bernstein used to do a presentation before all these young people's concerts, whether it was about Beethoven or Brown. This one, one day, the topic was the Beatles. I thought, oh. And he was talking about how interesting their harmonies, how unique they were compared to what was going on in rock, rock and roll music at the time. And I thought, if Leonard Bernstein thinks the Beatles are cool, I can tell my father that, and that rock and roll is cool. When I graduated, I went to a small liberal arts college in Finger Lakes called Hobart College, kind of as probably like co-college. I wanted to see how the rest of the world did, so I put my violin away. Didn't, didn't, didn't play it out. I wanted, no, I tried everything. I, I didn't like anything I tried, but I tried everything. <laughs> the last day of school, freshman year, I took my violin out. Figured, well, I know how to play this. 
couldn't play it off. I thought, well, I've done this all my life, and I should be able to do this. So after that, I started, I made the three, four week later, got it back out, practiced all the time, over to another band with my friend Rob and someone else. Had a few gigs over the summer. But the next next year in school, all I was doing was playing music. Writing music, playing music, wasn't going to classes. Called my mother. Said, Mom, I'm quitting school. That conversation lasted 10 seconds. <laughs> So I figured I had to come up with a plan B. So I called her a few weeks later and said, how about if I go to music school? She said, will you get a college diploma? I said, yeah. So she said, okay. So then I started, started working. I interviewed at in Ithaca. It was uh, with Carl Husa, genius. And at the time of the interview, he was at a class, so I knocked on the door, went, walked in that center, you know, told him I was here for the interview, handed him some music I was writing. <sighs> We're doing serious music here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought I'd better work on it a little bit more. Syracuse apparently saw something in me. Studied composition with Dr. Earl George. And just by luck, I wasn't I wasn't going to be a performance major. The professor was Louis Crasher. And I don't know if you know the name. You could Google it, find out. He is the reason there's an Alban Bear Violin Concerto. <laughs> He did the world premiere of that concerto and the Schoenberg concerto. But I was at the right place at the right time. So I tried a million Louis Crasher, we would call him Louis in during, during school, <coughs> I had a duo with Rob, the same person from years ago. We played five nights a week. Our main gig was in a place called the Bargen Country House. We started in, in the in the basement, and you could see you could, there was an opening, and there was someone mentioned, just mentioned chicken wire. There was chicken wire, not because people were throwing things, but if people, you know, not their beer bottle over or whatever, we'd be protected. But we graduated to the, to the top floor, and made more money, bigger crowds. <coughs> We did that all through school. That that paid for my school, but you know, playing every night and going to school during the day. And in order in order to get Dr. George was a wonderful composer. Uh, wasn't really a great advisor. I found out I don't remember how or when, but in order to graduate, I had to to do a performance recital. Uh, from the violin repertoire, uh, I think I did Falk on Company, uh, Beethoven Sonata, Frank, Martin, Madrigals, and a composition recital of my own music for one hour, whether I played it or not. But I, I don't even know if Dr. George told me that I had to do that to graduate. But I found out, and somehow, I, I, thinking about it now, I can't. I, I can't imagine how I put that together and worked at night, but I did. But I couldn't wait for the time where I would just have, all we, I do is play at night, not go, not go to school. When we graduated, we decided, like everyone in New York wanted to do, go to California. <laughs> so we got in, in our, packed up the van. Went to California. We stopped in Aspen. We wanted to do an audition for one of the clubs there. The man manager told us to come and play Thursday night for free, and that'll be the audition. 
But since we are acoustic, we, while he was eating, eating lunch, we just brought up our instruments, played a few songs. He said, oh, okay, then you can come play for me. Play, you can have the big weekends. And we also played <clears throat> at a place called Jake's Abbey there. Then we went to California. We had no money. We started out with no money, so we had the less money. We actually, when we, when we were in Aspen, when we first got there, we, we stayed at a place called Rick's Racks. And I think we stayed in a room with, I think there might have been 12 bunk beds. Very inexpensive, but we, like I said, we had no money. We got to California and the paper for a talent contest, I think it was called the Palomino Club in North Hollywood. So we won $50. It was like winning the lottery. <laughs> but then we ended up working in San Diego and we played, the place we played in San Diego had restaurants all throughout California. They moved us to mountains in California. And then after several months, several months, I got tired of it. Came went back to New York. New York. When I, I don't know how I got in this band, but it was a six-piece band uh, called called the Mossback Mule Band. Actually, there's some videos on YouTube. It was a good band. We made lots of money, but in the, our overhead was. We, we spent it on sound equipment, the trucks, so we, ne we, never, we never saw the money. One thing I'll say about Louis Krasman, he always surprised me. I remember walking out of a concert in Cross College, and I bumped into him, I was, I didn't want to see him because I didn't want, I knew he was going to say, what are you doing now, Ron? And I was so embarrassed to say, I'm playing fiddle in a country band. And he said, oh, that's wonderful. So many students, when they graduate, stop playing music. I'm so happy. He always, but that's, that's the only movie story here today. <laughs> country stars, or maybe other stars too, when they, after they, they've done their shows, or what they're, they would always love to go out here and hear local mu music here are lo what the local bands are like. So we were playing in a city called Westmoreland, and Charlie Dan walked in, listened to our last set. He ended up engraving. He signed his name on the guitar player's the Telecaster, but he engraved it with a ballpoint pen. The guitar player was ecstatic, so happy. We were playing at in Rome, New York, Mickey Gilly was playing at the Boonville Fair. After the fair, he, he and his band came to hear our band, the Mossback Mule Band, where we were playing. And my philosophy was always, if a band, if you heard something on the radio, why would they want to come hear us play exactly the way they played it. They could just play the record. Although m most of the bands tried their hardest to, to sound like the radio, like the record. M my philosophy was just the opposite. If we want to do a song, we need to create our own version of it. And that is the one thing that Gilly liked about, the best about it. Because of that, he decided to bring us here. He, Gilly's Club um, is, or was, before it mysteriously burnt down, <laughs> the largest uh, nightclub in the world. And he had just built a recording studio attached to it. And wanted us to come down, record an album, and play his fun. I remember seen um, on the Ed Sullivan show, the same place where the Beatles were. There was a Russian dance troupe 
were uh, floor length gowns and it looked like they were on roller skates. They were so fluid walking around. We went with the, the uh, Johnny Lee and Mickey Gillies bass player. We went, the first time we went, went in with that, we found out in New York, if you wear a hat, when you go inside, you can take your hat off. In Texas, get out of the car, walk up to the door, put your cowboy hat on, <laughs> <laughs> walk into the club, and there are people, and I saw that green <coughs> fluidity of doing the Texas two-step around that huge dance floor. Guys with their long, lone star long neck in their back pockets with their cowboy hats on. It was amazing. We recorded the album. Uh, nothing came of it. Not a surprise. We came back to New York. But while, while I was there, I made friends with the fiddle player in the house band, Robert Harridge. We were um, we would uh, write letters to each other. You know, on paper. <laughs> put them in a, I, I don't know, put them in a envelope and stay. There was no internet. Um, Can you explain that then? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Robert actually called me one day, said, Gillies, me, fiddle player just left, and he's looking for a new fiddle player. So I called Gilly. I said, Gilly, I'm your man. He said, we're leaving in three days. Can you be here in three days? I said, sure. So I got on the phone. I thought, how am I going to get out of there in three days? <laughs> when you're offer, offered an opportunity in the music business, take it. You don't know. I mean, I was I always wanted to go on the road in a, in a big bus with a, you know with a big star. Mickey Gilly wasn't the one I was thinking of, but there was the opportunity that that, that presented itself. So so I took it. Joined Gilly's band was called the Red Rose Express. His big hit at the, at, the, at the time was Room Full of Roses, so that's where they, they got the name. So I drove, packed up everything I could in my little Dodge Colt, found out that I had the only vehicle in the state of, te of Texas that did not have air conditioning. <laughs> Even old pickup trucks had air conditioning. I didn't have it. But he shared, shares the border with Houston. Two completely different cities. Driving down Red, Red Bluff, one of the main thoroughfares in Pasadena. After three days or two days, maybe on the road, uh, there was a huge white cinder block building with big, bold, red letters: "Knights of the Ku Klux Klan." Mm -hmm. Did I just go back a hundred years? <laughs> there again, you know, I rehearsed with the band. Gilly and the drummer take me in the back room, or side room, in this, near this, this studio. Told me two things. In the band I, band I had in New York, we wore t-shirts and blue jeans. So I figured if I'm playing for a uh, country star, I'm gonna, gonna have to wear nice western shirts and maybe press jeans. <coughs> so he told me two things. He said, what goes on on the road stays on the road. I thought, it's, you know, it's your business, you know, you can do what you want. And he said, he pointed to a coal rack and said, the old fiddle player was bigger than you, so you're going to have to get your suits altered before you go 
on the road. He points to a coat rack. There was a red one, a blue one, and a yellow one. <laughs> okay. I would put on the suit about one minute before the show, and the second the show was over, I didn't like this. <laughs> Someone wrote a ma magazine article that Ernie Azoff, who was a film producer, saw, read, it was called Urban Cowboy. And it was about Gillies. And that's when they decided to make the movie. So I was in the right place at the right time. Charlie Daniels uh, did, did several songs in, in the movie. When he was there, Gilly said, you want to meet, to meet Charlie Daniel? Sure. I already did, but I thought, you know, okay. He brings me out to him. Charlie looks at me and he says, Oh, Moss Bank Mule Band. I was shocked. What we're going to play is the song that I won the Grammy Award for. Orange Blossom Fest special. Every fiddle player in the world plays it. I happen to be there. Like I said, the right time, right place at the right time. Before we started to record it, Patsy Swayze choreographed the movie. Before we started recording the song, she walked in, into the studio. I, I was in a booth, and the rest of the band was in different places in the studio. And she, she was <coughs> in the control room, and she said, you know what? She got her, our attention and said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dance the hoedown that John Travolta is going to dance. And I want you to watch me. Watch me for the speed. I'm going to speed up in the middle. Watch me for that. I'm going to give you a cue for when it ends. And then it has to end right when I tie it. We followed her, and that's what we did. Then, the engineer said, Ron, can you just one day. Um, engineer said, can you play a harmony part to what you just, just did? I said, sure. So I did that. I played both of the parts on the track, but, they, but since there were two fiddle tracks, they wanted to have two fiddle players in the movie playing. So <laughs> you'll be watching John Travolta dance and Gator Conley. But if you happen to around one minute, minute into it, like I say, in the back left, you may see two fiddle players, but no.
nervous, how are you? <laughs> 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 One thing that I learned in the movie, I, you know, I've never been in a movie before. When the director says, take five, five just doesn't mean anything. It could be 10 minutes, 30, two hours. You, but the first time, we rushed back to back on stage to make sure we were ready. <laughs> then we started to get the feel of it and realized it, it didn't mean anything. So one time, when they said take five, John Lee um, came up to me and said, let's go over to the studio and write a song. I said, Johnny, what if they need me? I said, So we went over to the studio, spent four hours there. What a song, pretty good song, I thought. Came back, and they still were ready for it. Then by about an hour later, the director called me today, said, no, that's enough. It took me about three minutes to cut the just the, you know, in the studio. It took four hours to film, to film it. It's nine seconds. Nine seconds of music took four hours. We take the tape measure out to the camera, film one angle, do whatever they do for 20 minutes, come back, another angle, tape measure. They only have one angle on the film, but it that's <laughs> <laughs> four hours. Anyway, I think I just play up to that point. <laughs> said take five when Bonnie was there, we jammed uh, until they were ready for us next time. I'm probably the only person who ever sent a check back to the union. I got a check because I was standing next to Bonnie Ray in the movie. I guess 
I don't know if someone saw that and figured out I was on the session in LA. But they, they sent me a check and I called them and I said, what's the for? Because I wasn't in LA to do a session. And they sent me the, the union contract and it had my name with all these top LA session players. And I called them back and I said, that's not, that's not me, I'm sending you the money back. Uh, I, I said, I think it sounds to me like Byron Burleigh. You might want to start there. But, it, but it's not my money, it's still I want. Working for a country artist every night, they want you to sound like the record, their record. Every night you play, it's stifling musically. Because you just play the simple old part every single night. <laughs> So after two years, I moved to Boulder, Colorado. I uh, started a band with my brother. We had two fiddles, no lead guitar. I felt like I was unchained. I, could, I felt so free. But since there was no lead guitar, I had to <clears throat> figure out anything I could do electronically with effects or improvisation, whatever to make the violin the lead instrument and make it inter interesting. And so, still kept my philosophy of if someone already did it this way, why would we want to do it this way? We, we played in ski resorts and we played all the way in the Rockies, all the way from Boulder up to Edmonton, Alberta. And at the time, at that time in Edmonton, every any place you went, any club you went into, someone would say, Wayne Gretzky is going to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> Never saw him. <laughs> While we're setting up to rehearse one day, my brother says, you've been nominated for a Grammy. <clears throat> yeah, I said, sure. He said, no, look in the paper right here. So I, call, I called Neris and I said, I'm not in your band anymore. Do I, am I still eligible for, for this Grammy? He said, we don't care who's in the band. We care, if you, did you play on the record? That's what the Grammy's for. Well, I said, yeah, they did the research and then they sent me two, two tickets to the show. It was a, the last time they had it at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. If I were king of the Grammys, it would still be here. But <clears throat> Staples Center, you get to sell a lot more tickets. Tickets are not cheap. I didn't really consider whether we had a shot in win winning or not. Of course, that year, everybody knew we were the college, so. All I remember was when they announced the winner, I wasn't sure if they said our name. All I remember was I was sitting in a seat, and the next thing I knew, I was up on stage. <laughs> Don't know how I got there. <laughs> uh, the presenters were Jerry Mulligan and Helen O'Connell. <clears throat> One thing I found out. They, they don't know who, who, who the winners are until they open the envelope. So on the Grammy, the Grammy they hand you, it's just a plain plastic base <laughs> because they don't know. So as you're walking off stage, they ask for it back. I <laughs> 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 thought that if you want a Grammy award, you're automatically a member of NARES, the National Art Recording Arts and Sciences. When I moved to Nashville, I went to the, their office and said I you know, so wanted to join. They gave me the form I had to fill out and to meet the requirements. I said, no, I, I want a Grammy Award. I said, yeah, I know, but you got to fill this out. <laughs> so I did. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a voting member of, of 
narrative. I decided that if you're going to do something in, in the music business, you need to be in L.A., New York, or Nashville. I was going to go to L.A., LA but I ended up in Nashville. I knew more people in Nashville. And I'll, I'll never discourage, I, people, you know, say, oh, I want to go to Nashville and be a guitar session player or be a, be a star. I'll never discourage anyone from going in. But I'll go out of my way to tell them the reality. If you're going to go to Nashville, you want to work on sessions or work on the road, you need to be world class. You need to know know how to network, how to make networking is very important. And you need to be liked, well liked by everybody. If you're great, because there, there's so many great musicians there. If, if you're not well liked by, by producers, well, or you don't get along with the other players. What happens is every day, let's say someone in Davenport, Iowa, the best guitar player, that's everyone in Davenport, say, you, you're so good, you should go to Nashville. Every day, the best guitar player from wherever comes to Nashville. But one of them are going to end up being world class in making it there. So I don't, I don't discourage people, but I want them to know what it's like. About being world class, I was doing a gig at WSM TV, uh, it was a morning show. I don't know who I was playing for. Uh, but there was also a bass player playing. And so we, we did our, our set, we introduced this, this guy. His name was Edgar Meyer. Maybe you've heard. He plays now. He plays with uh, Yo-Yo Man, Marco Powder, and he teaches it now at Curtis and some other places. He said, but I never, no one had heard, had heard of him before. He started playing. Wow. It was one of them. It was just amazing. Players are the ones who come up with the music ideas for the records. When a producer calls you for a session, you have to know also where not to play. Very important. For live performance also. You never, ever want to get in, get in the way of the artist, of the singer. On stage, in a recording session, don't ever want to get in the way of, of the star. I was doing a session when I, when I moved back to Nashville. Gilly would still call me for step first session. Uh, he, he called me one time and told me, I want you to do this session for me. Told me how he wants me to play something. When I worked for him, he'd tell me how he wanted me to play something. I never understood what he was talking about. But he must have liked what I played. So he told me what, you know, like you did when you played for me in Texas. So um, they already cut the tracks. I was I went in to do the film tracks. John Bowen, after a while, stops me and said, Ron, quit trying to sound like Johnny Gimble. I want you to sound like Ron and I thought, I could do that. <laughs> One take, we're done, we're done. That was it. Just a few more. Things about, about playing the right things. Gene, I was doing a session, I think this must have been for the Urban Cowboy movie. I, I was there, I was warming up, tuning up, rosin the ball. 
while I started doing that, James Byrne walked in. Walked into uh, one, uh, one of the rooms, got his guitar out, listened to the song once, they played it back, he played his guitars. It was subtle and it was perfect. Packed up his guitar and he was done. I wasn't even better all that. I was doing one session at RCA Studio B where Elvis recorded. Um, I played one one high note kind of a stinger. They were hooting and hollering in the control room, just one note in the whole song. That, but that, that's what they, that's what they wanted. I did one session where I played a mandolin trill, up an octave, and that was it. Someone like that, they called me for another session, and they wanted me to do something just like that for their own record. It's not how many how many notes you play. It's playing the right notes in the right place. And not and knowing where not to play. When I when I lived in Hendersonville, you could north of Nashville, walk in the parking lot. Great great keyboard player was there. Great drummer lives there. Great fiddle player lives there. Great steel player lives there. Like, kind of hard to work with, so you know. Our, <laughs> That's important. If you don't, if you don't get along with them, when people don't want to work with them, producers, other players. So Daddy West, uh, guitar player, knocked on my door and said, uh, "Our fiddle player just quit. We're going on the road with Kenny Rogers in a couple of days." You want to go with us? Sure. Can you play rhythm, guitar? So he gave me some albums, some chord charts. No rehearsal. Drives into the arena. 
again, I'll, I'll just, I see just a bunch of blue scenes. Do the show, get back on the bus, go to sleep, wake up in the next arena, get out, look up. Looks like the same one, except now all the seats are red. <laughs> <laughs> So after the gig, after Donnie asked me if I wanted to work for, you know, be the regular fiddle player, and I turned it down because I was working, I, would, I had a job with a guy, Ken Lavoy, he went by the name of Lobo, if you ever heard a song, of a song, Me and You and a Dog Named Boo, <laughs> that was his big hit. Uh, but I, we used to play in clubs, the two of us. With, with with their house with the house bands, I really wanted. <coughs> uh, then he he decided he had enough in Nashville and wanted to move back to Florida and play golf. Get another knock on my door. I want to go out with Donnie West again. Sure. This time, at the end of the tour, Donnie said, "You want to? Would you like to be in? You know, be in my band?" When you're offered an opportunity in this business, take it. Because you don't know when another one is going to come your way. So I did. She was so different from any, any country artist I had ever worked for. She encouraged improvisation. If if you play it like a solo the same as you did the night before, you know, what's wrong? You're not feeling well? <laughs> there was one, one fiddle solo. And then one time she said, I'll play it again. So I played it again. Part of the show, after we did your cheating heart, one night she, had, she looked at me and said, play, just play something, anything. Okay, so I, I played over the rainbow, and then the next night she said, no, play, some, play something again, so this time I played over the rainbow again, but the next time I learned something different, so I played a different song, and then it, it became, then there was one, one song that I did, one, one time I started playing some Bach, and but there was one song that she really liked. So whatever I played, she always asked me to play that song. Then we played a couple of other, other fiddle songs, and it became that part of the show was like the Ronald Dean show. Doing the show was the best thing in the world. After the show, getting on the bus. Nothing was worse than you. But you learn how to read without getting nauseous. I saw every episode of the Andy Griffith show, show <laughs> five or six times. And that's all we had. Of course, there were, there were two of the guys on the bus that liked to watch movies where their heads blew up. When everyone went, went to sleep, uh, they would watch, watch those. Uh, but the first thing, Players in Nashville, their work class, and they're always trying to get better. No one ever thought they were good enough. Always thought everyone. I thought I was the only person. I thought I was terrible. Always had to get better. Then I found that this the keyboard player who was like my roommate with Donnie West, thought he was terrible. Always had to work on getting, getting better. He would set up his keyboard at night. I was getting ready to go to sleep, but he was conscientious. He put headphones on and practiced the keyboard. So I would hear, <laughs> I said, Barry, you're not, you're not helping me. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, 
Grand Ole Opry, we do our show, we do a sound check. Each one of us would spend about 20 minutes getting our sound, getting it right with, with the house, with the monitors. It'd take us four hours to do the whole thing. The Grand Ole Opry, there are three artists on, on a half hour segment. You have one artist does their segment. There's a commercial. You have 60 seconds to find the nearest amplifier, plug in, and and be ready to play. But the engineers there have been doing, doing it for years. They're excellent. Which you know, I just put plugged it into an amp. But you heard the sound of it. It's a very, very you know, professional sound. <coughs> we would, we would always play whenever, whenever we did the album. We got to do the TV segment. All the rest were on the radio. If the house band got to do the TV segment, they got the TV pay, which was higher. So I went, went to Weldon Myrick, the steel player, and said, you want to play with us? He said, of course. I said, Weldon, we're doing your sheet and harm again. He looked at me and said, they all pay the same. The journey is not over. I'm still, in the last several years, creating these two CDs. I also found out, we used to, we used to joke about phoning in your car. I was offered to play fiddle on a, on a recording for a, a band from Switzerland. They did the tracks there, put them in a Dropbox folder. I pulled the tracks out of the Dropbox folder, loaded it into Pro Tools, played my fiddle part, put it back in the Dropbox folder. They, Got in Switzerland. They did the same thing with a steel player. So you can't fold it in your bar. The journey is not over. Now I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. <laughs>
Well, then why do they call it the World Series? <laughs> 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 Yeah, we're done. Thank you.